John Sawatsky is an award-winning political and investigative journalist from Canada who has taught journalism and analyzed the process of interviewing for many decades. His client list includes newspaper, television, radio personnel from around the globe. He was hired by ESPN as a senior director of talent development in 2004 and recently retired, but still does consulting. We're here at his home in Burlington, Connecticut, to discuss his life's work. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Oh, thank you, Angel. You were born in Winkler, Manitoba? Winkler, Manitoba. Can you tell me about that town? When, when I was there in the 50s, I was born in 1948, and uh, it was one square mile, 12 blocks each, each direction, and uh, there wasn't much going on. It had a golf course, a six-hole golf course, okay. if you can imagine. That was about it. So what, you, you played it three times to get a, your regular score? Yeah, well, I, I, did, I never even set foot on the golf course. I was too young. I was like six years old. Okay. Where, where is it to, to, relative to, to Winnipeg? It's uh, 75 miles southwest, mainly south, a little west. So, you know, about 12, 15 miles from the North Dakota border. And your parents farmed? or My father was a car dealer. Uh, he was, started as a farmer, and then he became a photographer, had a photo studio, and then he went into, he became a Dodge DeSoto dealer in, in Winkler. And the, um, the winter of 1955-56 was a very severe one. And we got stuck in snow drifts once on the trip to Manitoba, to Winnipeg. And we had snow drifts in front of us and behind us, we were just stuck. And it looked pretty grim there for a while. And that winter was the one that convinced them <laughs> they wanted to get out. And so um, he sold his, uh, he was a partner, he sold his half of the car dealership. And we moved out to the Fraser Valley in British Columbia. Okay. And he went back into photography instead of a photo studio in Clearbrook, BC. That would explain why you worked for the Vancouver Sun then. So I basically grew up in British Columbia, yeah. you know, about uh, 50 miles outside Vancouver. A great place to grow up. You know, like we could drive into Vancouver anytime. You had the big city, but we still had the small town life in, in the middle of the Fraser Valley, you know. We were two or three miles north of the American border, so we could flip across the border if we wanted to... Uh, yeah. There was no pizza place in, in Clearbrook or Abbotsford. And so we had to go to Bellingham, Washington to get pizza back in those days. Okay. You know? <laughs> and the bowling alley was also south of the border. So uh, The important know, stuff. The important stuff. <laughs> I remember uh, the Abbotsford Air Show. We lived... My father eventually went back onto farming. And uh, uh, our farm abutted the uh, Abbotsford Airport. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we were planting raspberries, it, and the Abbotsford Airport, it was the backup to the Vancouver Airport when it got fogged out. And it was also the training ground for CP Air, it was then known. And so while we were planting raspberries, right beside us, all those big, massive 737s were coming in and just landing, touching down, and then taking off again, and then touching down, taking off. They're training their pilots there, you know. So I guess you washed off those raspberries before you ate them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where did you study journalism? I never studied journalism. I didn't. No, I never went to journalism. Hmm. I always joke. Probably I mean, a I've, good thing. I've taught at various journalism schools. Yeah. And I always joke that I probably wouldn't have qualified to get into journalism school. <laughs> But I still taught there. And uh, no, I, I took um, economics and political science at Simon Fraser University. Well, it's kind of interesting. I was always a political junkie as, as, since I was like eight years old. Mm -hmm. Followed politics. And W.A.C. Uh, Bennett? You follow him? Oh, Wacky Bennett. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I eventually got to interview him a few times and covered him a number of speeches. He, uh, he, this was very late in his career, but. He was quite a character, wasn't he? Quite a character, you know, yeah. like one of the last, the last of a kind, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. that you don't really see around anymore. What kind of kind? 
Well, he's the kind of guy who changed histories. I mean, um, uh, he had trouble finding a party, so he basically latched onto the Social Credit Party, party, which at the time was a funny money party, and he changed it into a conservative party. And he basically went out and he was a millionaire. Yeah. And he went out and bought elections and uh, hmm. uh, started this party from nothing and became premier of the province, who absolutely ran it for 20 years, uh, put the province on highways. I mean, he did a lot of things, but he also was very odd and a bit of an iconoclast. Mm-hmm. But anyways, at university, I was into politics and uh, I ran for student council and got elected. And I remember walking into my first student council meeting. And I was just walking through the doors and I saw the big round table where the councillors all sat around. And off to the side was a little rectangular table, the press table. And as soon as I walked through the door, I said, my role is not there. It's at the press table. Like I just knew it, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And I actually wanted to resign as a politician and uh, but of course I'd just been elected you can't just <laughs> resign so I served out my uh, term <laughs> as a as a counselor student counselor and uh, didn't run for re-election and went straight to the student newspaper and found a very happy home there and uh, that led to a job at the Vancouver Sun as a reporter where I started just as night shift covering the city mm-hmm. under a city desk you were distinguished in that role uh, over time, and uh, then you got into investigative journalism and, and wrote a number of uh, important books. I like to get into things. The, the problem with daily journalism that I, I struggled with, I mean, it was good. It's, it's a good for adrenaline, hitting the deadlines, you know, and mm. Vancouver Sun had three deadlines a day. And it's it's good hitting those deadlines and that's but you know once you get the story and it's over you move to another different story you have to start over from zero again you know yeah completely particularly if you're a general assignment reporter and I wanted to get my teeth into things and you know and uh, so I started becoming an investigative reporter and I started doing the energy B two mm-hmm. which turned out to be a very good decision because energy in the early seventies. I mean, I started at Vancouver Sun in October 1970. And uh, by 73, you had the oil crisis. And by then, I had developed myself as an energy reporter and as an investigative reporter. And so I was the guy. I was living on the front page. You know, and it, mm. was, it was really good for, mm-hmm. for the career. Uh, and basically, on the basis of that, I got sent to Ottawa, way ahead of my time. I never... Like, I didn't go through the grooming process. I but you still, got exposure early on? And yeah, I was still working and... night shifts and stuff. But going from night shift to Vancouver Sun to covering the, you know, the Parliament Hill in Ottawa, that's that's quite a jump in one swoosh. So, but that's what happened. And then, of course, when I got to Ottawa, uh, that's like being in heaven if you're a political junkie like me. You know, and here I was, you know, on Parliament Hill, had the run of the hill, sticking my head into doors of various MPs. It was good, but it was also the easiest journalism I ever did in my life because everything comes to you. You All you have to do is stay on Parliament Hill. You know, I had my desk in the press gallery and everything happened within one or 200 yards of my desk. I mean, the House of Commons was just down the hall, Mm -hmm. the caucus meeting rooms, the cabinet, I had to go up one floor. Thursday mornings was cabinet meetings. Uh, one floor, one hall down, and I'd be waiting outside the door of the cabinet meeting, you know, to get, you know, the press conference theater was just across Wellington Street. Everything was there and it was served to you. It was, it was just too easy. So I decided to go get back to my investigator roots and uh, started to take deeper projects. And that ultimately led me to the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. You know, and not not only the most difficult journalism, the most difficult anything, including work on farms and anything like that, any manual labor. Uh, and I got involved in investigating a story about RCMP illegal activity. 
And that started off the whole security intelligence thing. And that absolutely was hard. It was hard because what? Your life was threatened? No, not threatened. Um, well, maybe a little bit later, but I mean, that wasn't the... It was a... Nobody at that time figured the Royal Canadian Mounted Police could undertake illegal activity. They were still these paragons of virtue. I went down into the um, Library of Parliament. That's a beautiful, beautiful room. Beautiful building. I went down into the basement and pulled up some old Royal Commission reports. And I read this report from on security, which came out in 1969, I think it came out. Very boring. Numbered, written by lawyers, numbered paragraphs and everything. In the middle of one of these paragraphs was this one sentence which just jumped out at me. You know, it, and it said, it is inevitable that a security service will, in, will violate the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law. And this jumped out at me, you know. And of course, in the years before that, the U.S. had gone through all kinds of scandals about illegal police activity, you know. Seymour Hirsch was doing some investigative work, and by this time, Watergate was over, and, you know, other, all kind of FBI stuff had come out. So when you're doing this, it's like you're attacking Canada. Yeah, none of this had ever come out in Canada. Because we're better than the States. We would we're never better. do that. Exactly. And our RCMP is better than their FBI. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I figured this is when the light bulb went off. And I said, well, I mean, Canada in some ways is a very parallel to the United States. And if it's happening in the U.S., it's, it's happening in Canada. And I said, okay, I'm going to go find some. And that led me down the track to eventually to Montreal, where there was some evidence of stuff going on. But this was in the security service, which is the most secret part of, of government, mm -hmm. pretty much. And, uh, and a lot of it was in the French-speaking part. It was in Montreal, was in, in the GRC. And, uh, and so it makes you look like a prejudiced as well, right? Exactly. And I didn't speak a word of French. Yeah. You know, not even, I didn't even have high school French. You know, uh, when I took high school, our second language was German in the community where I grew up. So how do you get any information then? You just rely on other Francophone journalists? or You have to do it in English, you see. And these guys, you know, they, they, work, they worked in the security service. They signed oaths before they went in. They didn't tell their wives what they were doing. So why would they talk to, to a, a journalist from Vancouver, from the West Coast, who only speaks English? And they have to they can't even do it in their native language, you know. So it was a tough. Pretty one. hard. Yeah. It was pretty tough. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but you know things worked out. I had a couple lucky breaks here and there, and and the story broke, and then eventually that led to a royal commission wow. of inquiry, the McDonald Commission. So when you think about it, you know your uh, objective as a as a journalist is it's to do exactly that and to make change in the world and, and, and as a result of what you did having a royal commission cranked up that's uh, that's a pretty good validation yeah of the royal, and of course when when my stuff came out it was attacked as being crazy it was done uh, you know mm -hmm. and of course the royal commission not only came out and and verified everything they actually went a little further right because i was very cautious you mm -hmm. know i figured okay rather than having this double sourced i'm gonna have to get this triple sourced just to make extra sure. And so I was very careful, make sure I was solid on the facts. And if anything, I'd been a bit conservative. You, uh, at some point, must have asked some pretty damn good questions. Well, yeah, so where does interviewing fit into all of this? So, so my question then is, what kind of questions elicited the best answers when you were doing these various uh, books on the RCMP and Mulroney and, and Kuzenko? Well, I don't think my interviewing was all that good when I was doing that work. Where the interviewing, my interest in the interviewing came up was, um, well, it started back in Vancouver when, I mean, it, it's a long process. There isn't sort of one aha moment. I started to tape my interviews when I was a print reporter back in Vancouver. And that was really eye-opening. 
because you have to listen back and hear your own tape. Uh, and I hear myself stammer. And I mean, I was just making a transcript of it. Yeah. I was just getting the information because I was a print reporter. Yeah, but just listening to yourself. You know, and I could hear the bad questions come out. Now, I didn't always know why they were bad. Right. You, know, but, um, you just were un- unsatisfied with the answers? And I, that's defined I, being a bad question? I think I was embarrassed by my own voice, I think. You know, part of that. Mm, okay. you know, it's just that nobody likes to hear themselves. And I mean, I've coached a lot of TV anchors, and even they don't like to hear themselves. You know? Well, they feel what? Uh, I, they feel strange. I mean, hear the, their voice come back, it, and it doesn't sound, on tape, it doesn't sound the same as it does coming from their own mouth. You know? And they don't like what they're saying, or they don't like how they make mistakes or stumble, or like, what's the problem? They're just uncomfortable with it. Don't know why? Well, with me, it was hearing, like, I'm not mellifluous, you know. Mm. Um, you are right now, though. Well, <laughs> not as much as I'd like to be. But uh, it doesn't come out always coherently. And, of course, you have your false starts and you trip up on your own words and this kind of stuff, you know. Mm. Uh, and sometimes you don't seem to know what you want to ask. All the hesitations, slowness, that kind of stuff comes up, you know. Mm-hmm. And you're hearing it all come back, you know, in almost in stereo. Uh, and you just want to shirk away from it, you know. So you want to do improve. So I wanted to improve, and so I started working on my questions, you know, and actually being more careful when I write out my questions in advance. And I remember when Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister and I was in Ottawa covering him, there was a period of time where um, Trudeau had weekly press conferences. Uh, So we all got a chance to ask at least one question every week to him, you know. Now with Pierre Trudeau, he was a very philosophical guy. With him, questions really mattered. He paid attention to the questions, and he'd work his way through it. And I would work my way through my questions as I wrote them in advance, you know, long before the press conference. And I write it this way. Now, if I write it this way, which way will he react, you see? And it caused me to realize there's a lot more involved in the skill of writing a question. People seem to think questions are questions, you know. And I learned then that they're not. Uh, construction is important. And that was the second stage of discovery in terms of interviewing. And then um, then I got to Carleton University, which I taught on the side as an adjunct professor. Mm-hmm. And you learn when you teach. I learned a lot when I taught. You know? And uh, so I taught um, investigative. I teamed up with Joe Scanlon at first, one of the professors there. And we taught investigative journalism for fourth-year students. And basically, I, I took over the class, and uh, we made it into an interviewing class. <laughs> because, mm-hmm. you know, some of the best... This is before computer-assisted reporting. Okay. Now there actually is, you know, there is a technology there to, to teach in computer-assisted reporting. Mm. But back then, the computer hadn't really taken hold yet. Investigative research still came from oral sources. You know, you've okay. got to, un- how do you unlock somebody's head? So how do you? Well, through the interview, through good questioning. So I had my students, uh, my students got involved in some of my book research. That was part of the deal. Carlton gloriously underpaid me. <laughs> and in return, I got partial <laughs> compensation for I got the research. Right. See, that, that was the, the, the deal. So I had students go out and uh, work on parts of the book, doing interviews that... Which book was that? Partly the lobbying book uh, and the insiders. A little bit even on the Gazenko book. There was a a couple of interviews done very early on in that. But most most of it was on the Mulroney book. And there I divided the the group up into teams and I divided Mulroney's life up into periods. He had different groups of students working on different periods of his life. And who did they interview? Classmates at St. FX, classmates at Lavelle, uh, law partners in the law firm in Montreal, those kinds of people. Did you coach them on what kind of questions to ask? Well, here, here, that's this part of the evolution. At the beginning, of course, we're just finding our way. And so they, they go and do interviews. And we didn't have prepared question lists. Uh, and of course, I would critique. And they would come back with... Of course, everything was taped. 
the only way you know for sure in a student interview what goes on is if it's taped and then they make word perfect transcripts you know because you can't rely on the students words you know because they're not at that point of analysis yet and you know they have trouble sometimes separating fact from opinion so they made they taped and then they transcribed so every week these transcripts would come landing on my desk uh, and I would critique them, and they would be marked on... The what evaluation did you, like, what evaluative criteria did you use? Oh, uh, well, the quality of the questions, the quality of the follow-up. But what, what, were, what were those questions? What, what made a good question, what made a bad well, question? Well, this, this is what it developed into. So at, at first, it, it was pretty loosey-goosey, and they came up with their own questions. And after a while, we realized, okay, uh, we need some kind of standardized questions. Now they could ask any questions they wanted, but we we met as a group and we, what are our priorities here? What do we want to get in this interview? Why are we doing this interview? Okay, so once we have that objective figured out, then what kinds of questions do we ask to meet these criteria? So we came up with a group of questions. So every student had to ask those questions. Now, of course, a lot of the value is in the follow-up. What do you do after, on the follow-up question? And that you can't plan in advance. So here we got these different people being interviewed about the same person, about the same events in his life, using the same question. Yes, yeah. Okay, and here's where the social science aspect comes in. Okay, so there's a variable there, you see. And this is where my eyes really got opened. Uh, and I realized that Certain questions consistently got great answers. Certain questions consistently bombed, or they had a low batting average, you know. I mean, it's not, there's nothing like 10 out of 10 or 0 out of 10. It's usually you have a low batting average or you have a really good batting average. Am I jumping the gun by saying what kind of questions got the best answers? Well, that's, those are the principles I derived, you see. And out of that, so I realized, okay, if the question isn't working, you can't not ask the question. Because you had a set list, right? Well, you, yeah, you, you have a reason for doing the interview. And yeah. if, if you're not going to ask along that reason, then you have to ask yourself why you're doing the interview. Yeah, in fact, uh, that's what Terry Gross, the, the interviewer on NPR, has said. She says, I try to clarify in my own mind why this person matters and why it's worthy of our listeners' time. Yeah, exactly. Th that's her purpose. But yours was, what, I want to find dirt on, on uh, Mulroney? No, we want to, uh, in terms of the students, if you want to ask me about my bigger overall object, you know, objective of the book, I can happily do that. If you want to talk about the students, they, they each had their own little area. I want and, to talk about how you become a successful interviewer of authors primarily mm -hmm. i want your secrets you, you going to give me those oh sure yeah yeah out, out of that research we developed a, a series of principles now there's two dimensions happening in the interview you got there's two plates you have to keep spinning first of all let me let me background if, if you want to get a sense of the methodology i teach okay start at the beginning there's two things we do as journalists Fundamentally, two things. I mean, what is our role as journalists? Our, our role is to inform society about what's going on in society. And yeah, although, again, it, uh, as far as, like, my podcast is focused on the book. Yeah. So I'm interested in getting really interesting, uh, riveting information out of an author. Mm hmm that that might help society or it might not. Yeah. I want to, I want my listeners to be interested okay. and not bored. Okay. And I think that's what, you know, author interviewers... Okay, so, so ask me a question and I'll give you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of questions get the best responses? Question, okay, in terms of if you're looking just through the narrow focus of the question as opposed to the bigger focus of the interview, yeah. this is the, the two aspects... What makes an interesting interview isn't necessarily what makes interesting information. Those are different things. So um, you need the right question at the right moment. Okay, and it's, it's I'll, I'll use a sports analogy like football. So 
before the game, the coach has a game plan. But within that game plan are a bunch of plays. The playbook is full of plays. Each play is, is very carefully crafted and defined. All, all the plays in the playbook are good plays. Otherwise, yeah. they wouldn't be in there. Yeah. But it may not always be the right play at that time. And it depends on how the defense is defending it, how it's yeah. successfully or not. Is, is, it, is it fourth and ten or is it fourth and one? If it's a fourth and one, you might want to go for it. Right. If it's fourth and ten, you probably don't want to go for it. You see, and you punt. Uh, but it, and if it's a fourth and one, then the, the long bomb pass is not what you're going to be doing. You just want to get that one you yard. Want, you want the one yard. You right. See? right. And so it depends where you are, and that, that's the game plan. You see, and an interview has a structure. It has a be, uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know. It has certain peaks it has to hit, and it has to come out at a certain point. Those are the big planning decisions. Okay, those are what I call the macro. I'm an old economics student, and so I just took micro and macro from economics. It's a perfect fit, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and the same reason that economics divides the field into micro and macroeconomics is because they're two different sets of forces. Yeah. And same with the interview, okay. There's the design of a question and there's the design of an interview. So you can, just like you have a um, design of a tree is different than the design of a forest. You can have a healthy tree in a sick forest or you can have a sick tree in a healthy forest. You can have a good question in a bad interview, you have a bad question in a good interview. Okay? So you, you have interview designs and you have question designs. So if you're asking me, this is why I'm, you ask me what kind of question, the answer is it depends, okay? So if you're thinking only in terms of the question, it should follow three principles. Open, neutral, and lean. It should be open-ended, because those are the most powerful questions. The question is the only tool the journalist has in the interview. It has to do the work. It has to do the heavy lifting. And if you break down the question and look at the part of it that does the heavy lifting, you, know, you break down the question itself into components, you get two components that really matter. I call it the, the topic and the demand. The question has to be about something, and then it has to also create an obligation. So if I ask you, what do you think about the weather? So the topic is the weather, and the demand is what do you think? Now, if I ask you that question, you will give me a response because I've made a demand on you. Now, if I just say, Nigel, it's a great day out there this morning. Yeah, you made a statement. I'm making a statement. I'm not making a demand. Yeah, you you're you're hoping I'll respond to it. Yeah, yeah. You're hoping exactly. You see, mm -hmm. and the only tool we have is the question, and the, the part of the question that does the work is the demand. Yeah. And there's only two kinds of demands in the universe: they're either open or they're closed. Uh, and closed, all you're asking is for a confirmation or a denial that yeah. will not get the job done. Yeah. See. So, yeah. so that's where open comes in. Yeah. I mean, a good way to start is just tell me about yourself. People well, that's like, a command. I, I, I prefer a question. It's, it's technically it's a, not a question. A bit more. You want something a bit more focused and narrow than that? or No. Something that makes a demand. Well, I just I demanded you tell me about yourself. <laughs> well, you, you, you give me an order. Yeah, and you and you say it's a I, I don't want to tell you about myself. Yeah, yeah. Right, you're you're bridling at that. If there are a couple of coaches, Greg Popovich is one of them, and what's the the hockey coach? You speak coach in your Rangers. They will bristle if you give them a command. Well, ask yes. me a question. What are yeah. you asking me? Yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, <clears throat> with most people, it doesn't matter, you know. Yeah. But it, it does. It, but it does. You have process. to read your. Obviously, you have to read your interview candidate asking that question. If you, if you know that they're kind of what they've got an ego and they don't like being bossed around, then that's not a good question. Yeah, but why even go through that? Why not just follow good methodology mm -hmm. and ask a question, and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. You're on safe ground. You're making a high level demand, mm -hmm. and you're on safe ground. But okay. this is where procedure. There's so many little tripwires that you can fall across. And so if you have good procedure, you miss a lot of those.
Yeah, I mean, my main objective, and I think people who interview authors, they want to get an interest, interesting response. Just interesting. It doesn't have to be a, about a specific news mm -hmm. item. It's not like interviewing a politician where maybe they've told a lie and you want to prove that they're lying. With When you interview an author, you just want to get something interesting. Yeah, but that's looking through it from too narrow of a lens. How do you find what's interesting, you see? Yeah, I define it as what I find interesting. Well, exactly. Now, see, and, and you're, you're again playing that roulette game, you know, and you're just hoping you shoot a bullet and there's something there, you see, mm. uh, and you're really not in control of the process. Uh, if you understand what makes something interesting, because interesting stuff, something that's interesting, may yeah. not be interesting in another context. Yeah. And this is where the bigger picture comes in. So if you have a command of the overall methodology, it's much safer. A, it's way better, but it's also much safer. Like can more you, reliable, you have a higher... Can you give me a thumbnail of the overall methodology, or is that going to take your book <clears> that, <throat> that we have to get when you've finished writing it? Oh, I mean, it's no, no big secret. I mean, uh, if you want to... I mean, okay, well, what, are you, what are you asking me? And I'll try to answer. Me? Yes. Right now? Yeah, what are you asking me? Same thing I asked you to start with. I want to do better author interviews. How do I do that? Is that too broad a question? No, no, that's, that's a, it's a big question. And it's, it starts with knowing what your goal is. Well, the goal is to get interesting responses that thrill my audience. Okay. If you want to get interested, then you need to look at the macro context probably first. Structure the interview along a storytelling structure. Like there, once upon a time and follow the chronology? Well, I, you could probably say that, I guess. I mean, that, that, that would be not hitting it right. But a friend of yours can go overseas and have a harrowing experience, escape an earthquake and by the skin of their teeth. You know, and they can come back and tell you about it and they can bore you to death with that story. And another friend can tell you about having to do the same piece of laundry three times in order to get it clean <laughs> and can have you hanging on every, the edge of every word. Yeah. Okay? yeah. <laughs> so it's not the information. And, and this is where people get caught up. They think, oh, I have to get an interesting piece of information. Yeah. Information is relative, whether it's interesting or not, depending on the circumstance. You see? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you take a, what could be an interesting piece of information, put it out of context, it's meaningless. But in another context, it can have you on the edge of your seat. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And so that's the bigger, if you see the bigger picture here, uh, and that's, that's the point I'm, you know, I want to get across. Yeah. Uh, and that gets back to storytelling. What makes something interesting? It's storytelling. What and what makes an interesting story? Well, uh, what makes a story interesting? I think is what you're... If you tell a story well, it'll follow a story form. And it'll be automatically interesting, even though the, the information isn't significant. And what makes it interesting is the dramatic arc, the building of the arc. And it's the arc. It's not the information on the arc. It's the structure, the shape of the arc. Building up to a climax. Building up, you see, yeah. Getting people involved. They want to know, they want to know, they want to know. You know? Which is what you're doing with uh, this interview. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just trying to answer your questions. You're, now, as the interviewer, yeah. you are structuring the interview. I am. Because you choose the topics. I'm just pounding away at the same question. <laughs> and you're, you're, making a, you're, you're, uh, you're creating suspense. <laughs> I well, think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying a little. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll continue with uh, Howard Stern here. You mentioned the three key, uh, uh, key points in the interview. The three qualities of questions? Yes, uh, so I wrote them down. Let's see. One of the joys of working with a podcast is I can cut all this stuff out. Oh, yeah. Whereas you teach people to be live on air, right? 
and they can't do this. Well, some of them are taped, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of them are live. Yeah, here we are. Uh, open, open-ended questions is what you yeah. said. Yes, about the questions. Yeah. Uh, neutral is the second one, <clears throat> and here's here's what Howard has said. He's just come out with. Uh, a I, new yeah, book. I've seen. Nice looking book. I've read a bit of it. And what Howard says is that the most important rule of being successful on radio, ahead of, quote, nothing is casual, is to have a definite opinion, a strong one, and to back it up. For the interviewer? Correct. I couldn't disagree with that more. Yeah, I kind of figured. Yeah. I tend to agree when it's and you didn't necessary. you did question, so I didn't follow up. <laughs> I just need right. No, I'm about to. I'm about to. I'm not letting you go on that. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I tend to agree with when it's when it's appropriate with Howard. If you can come up with a, 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 a spirited defense of an opinion that's contrary to the person you're interviewing, typically you'll get a rise out of them which is perhaps what he's looking for and mm -hmm. I'm looking for, which is a kind of an intense response. Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to your goal. What is your goal? If your goal is to get a rise out of them, yeah. okay, that's easy, right? You mm -hmm. just have to throw a trigger word at them. Yeah. You know, and it's easy to provoke people. But then it goes back to what do you get? You, you get a reaction. It may be an interesting reaction. Yeah. It may be, and it may even be revealing, you see. But... It's luck, and you're you're hoping, you're you're kind of poking them in the chest, and you're hoping it produces something, and sometimes it will, and sometimes it won't. So what you're saying is <clears throat> being neutral always gets the right response. Always, 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 always. There's very few rules in journalism, in, in, in interviewing. Interviewing is is not a science, like it's not. Like chemistry, you put two chemicals together, you know 10 times out of 10 exactly what's going to happen. Mm. Interviewing is not that, never will be. On the other hand, neither is it an art, where basically you can do whatever you can get away with. Whatever you can sell to the public is considered art. Uh, it's in between. It's a social science. It's like okay. economics. Okay. There's some science elements... But because of the human components, there's some real art elements to it as well. And also, because you mentioned human elements. The chemistry between you and me, that's really important, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> if, there's, if there's a good rapport, yep. if you don't have a good rapport... Well, exactly. And you know, how do you get that? This mm. is where the input-output thing that I started talking about earlier mm -hmm. is so important. What? You have to understand who's the inputter and who's the outputter. You know, when you develop rapport, that's, you know, but that's a whole, we're, we're getting off a tangent here. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for focusing. <laughs> so. Uh, Neutral, yeah. Yeah. So there, there are, there aren't a whole lot of rules in interviewing. Mm. Neutral is as close to being a rule as there is. And uh, if you can find an exception for me. Let me know. In well, I mean, every time minutes. Howard opens his mouth, that's an example. Well, exactly. If you look at the examples, we have to look at the examples. Play me an example, and I'll I'll break it down for you. Okay. I mean, that's what I do. I break down interviews, and, uh, and I will show you how he leaves stuff on, on the, the table. floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. And uh, that could be what? He, that could be really interesting. He doesn't maximize. His potential. That's a good thing, though, for him. No, it's, I mean, he, he hasn't maxed out his potential. So he's got a reason to get up in the morning, to continue. Well, he hasn't maximized the potential of his guest. So he has his guest for whatever time he has, 10, 15, 30, an hour, whatever. He has that guest for that period of time. And that's a precious resource, that time. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, you want to get the most out of it. Yeah. And he doesn't get the most out of his guest. So, you know, back to neutral. Neutral, I will maintain, should always, questions should always, always, always be neutral. Now, just think about it. Why are you asking a question? 
the purpose of the of a question is to discover something, okay? And if you truly want to find out what the other person wants to know, why would you project a value in your own question? Why would you put your own opinion in there if you actually if your goal, because that, that's well, highly influential and it it's distorting, it distort, it creates bias. It affects the quality of the answer. If you want to find out what's really inside that person's head, you shouldn't poison your question with an opinion. I think if, if I give a really well-reasoned response to an opinion that the uh, person I'm interviewing has, that's only going to get them to think harder and give me a deeper, more satisfying response. No, it, all it does is it polarizes them. And it makes them defend. And, and you're the loser. Look, um, they're not going to say, oh, oh, everything I've been doing in my life is wrong. You're right. Oh, okay, I just got an epiphany here. No, they're going to say, this is why everything I've been doing in my life is right. Exactly. All you do is harden their position. If you want to get accountability, you know, if you get somebody says, you know, they're lying to you. How do you get them to stop lying? You know, your method just puts a, makes them dig deeper into mm -hmm. their mistruth. And also, it's an unfair playing field. Because in terms of, you do an interview, right? Right now, okay, of the two of us, I'm supposedly the expert on the interview, right? Yeah. So I have greater expertise. Yeah, you spent your whole life. Okay. Or much of it, yeah. So if you get into a fight on this issue with me, who's going to win this? Well, I don't see it as a win-lose thing. Well, but I see it as getting to getting more interesting information. Yeah, but you're 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 battling them. That it's, you're you're picking a fight, and you're saying you're wrong. Here, no, no, I'm not saying that. Sure, I'm saying here's an alternative viewpoint. I'm not saying you're wrong at all. Of course, you're you're advocating. I mean, that's that's exactly what you're saying. You're advocating that piece. You know, rather than asking them, okay, what do you think about the alternative? Mm -hmm. How do you see it? it? Well, yeah, that's a, sort of like how I would say it. Here's an alternative. What do you think about that? Okay, now that, okay, but that's different from what you said earlier. Well, that, that's sort of what I'm getting at, though. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's what is in their mind, not in what's in your mind. Okay, your motives, your motives don't count. Mm -hmm. Okay, if your methodology is wrong, your, your motives don't count. Uh, because they're going to be reacting to what comes out of you not what you are thinking inside. I mean, they're not reading your mind. So here you are talking to somebody who knows more about the subject than you do. Yeah. You're getting into a, a, a counter situation here. I'm not, saying, yeah, I'm not trying to be aggressive. I'm not trying to put them down. No, I'm, no. I'm simply giving an interesting point of view that's different from theirs. Yeah, but you see, the person with the more information usually wins the argument. They can be in the wrong... If you know more about it, you you've got more the, resources to call. Exactly, he has more knowledge. He has yeah. more. He can pull up more. Oh, there's this, this report coming here, which contradicts exactly what you're saying, and, and yeah, and you don't have the expertise to counter it. But then at that point, I would say, next, I would just ask the next question because I'm happy I got information about that study that I'd never heard of before. Yeah, but you've never really put it to them. I say, mm. this, this is where you leave stuff on the table. This is where the, um, the irony of this is. People mm -hmm. think to be tough in an interview, you have to really be confrontative and, and you have to put it to them. And those are what I call tough sounding questions. They're not tough questions. They're actually easy questions. And they're tough sounding. To really make it tough, uh, I mean, I think your instinct is right. You have to make them work. You have to make the gears in their mind turn. Yeah, I don't want them giving me the canned response they give to everyone else. Exactly. So how do you get them to think about it? Rather than defend themselves, right? Mm -hmm. well, I, I guess it's not themselves, though. It's defending their idea. Rather than defending anything, okay, make them break it down and explain it to you. They can say, okay, if you, if you go through the issue sort of logically and say, okay, what are you doing here? Okay, and how, how do you do that? Why do you do that? Well, you know... I'm not always sure why I do it. I guess I've got myself into a rut, okay? Mm -hmm. But what about... Now, suddenly you open up doors that weren't open before. I've yeah. gotten people break down and confess. But you never do it on the first or second question. 
it's usually the third, fourth, fifth, sixth question that does it. It's, it's the follow-ups. It's the follow-ups that aren't <clears throat> confrontational, that aren't providing an opposite opinion. Well, the whole process shouldn't be confrontational. You're working with them, but with what you raise, you're actually working against them, and you're giving them something to knock down. So Part that's of my it thinking... It gets back to the neutral thing. Not being neutral doesn't make sense. I mean, it works to a, it works to a certain level, to a superficial level, and then beyond that, it runs out of gas. I mean, it gets a reaction out of them, but it doesn't get them to think, okay? A reaction is a motor response. It's not a thinking response of the mind. Okay. You have to get into their mind. What's driving me is uh, Montaigne, who said something along the lines of, if there isn't disagreement <clears throat> in a conversation, if everyone agrees, it's a boring conversation. Not necessarily. According to Montaigne, that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the obvious, easy. I mean, when there's disagreement and there's chaos. No, I'm, right, so I'm, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm making the controlled, point. Controlled disagreement, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm just saying it seems to be the basis of that is the disagreement is the interesting part. It's not because the disagreement has to be controlled. There has to be some process, some method to it. Again, you're back to structure. Storytelling is about structure. It all comes back to structure. And who controls the structure? The interviewer. The success of the interview is much more dependent on the interviewer than mm -hmm. the interviewee. Well, so are you suggesting then that, that every interview should sort of tr build up to a climax and then a denouement? <clears throat> or that's basically what... Not happen? every interview, because not every interview is appropriate for that. But probably the majority of them. I mean, some are like breaking news. So if you get the prime minister, you, you get somebody big and important, then the importance of the information takes priority over the importance of the story. Getting back to my question about authors, what do you think are the best kind of author interviews? Oh, okay, that's, that's wide open. That's neutral. <laughs> and it's a big subject. Like one of the most interesting author interviews you've ever uh, you've ever listened to, and why? Oh man! Well, the, the ones that give me a reason to listen, you know, the ones that tell me stuff, they have to be interesting. They have to be also revealing. Of the person themselves, or just of, of anything. They have to reveal something about something. And usually when somebody reveals something, they reveal themselves as well. Because it means they have to make decisions. Uh, and decisions get to your priorities and how you value different things. And that's, that's revealing. So what's the best kind of question to ask to get someone to reveal something? Oh, it gets back to the open neutraline. I mean, it, it, that's the core of it. You have to get the right play in the right context, the right question at the right moment. It's, you, it's not telling me anything, though. Do, do you know? Well, if you give me an example, I can point out. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you a general principle here. Yeah. So there's no meat on the bones. You need it's, an example. We need an example. Maybe so, a, one author has been writing under a pseudonym, but hasn't told anyone. But I know that they are. Yeah. So how do I get them to reveal that? And they agree to an interview? They agree to an interview. They don't know that I know that they've written something under another name. Oh, uh, go and um, ask them about the issue. So you want to uh, you want to unmask them for being the author of this other book that no one knows they wrote. Yeah. Yeah. And the book is about a certain subject. Ask them, what do you think about a certain subject? This is where strategy becomes so important in an interview. And that's the macro side of what I teach. You need a strategy. You need a path on the interview. And you need to build up areas of agreement. So there's, as I say, there's various different ways you could do this. Ask him about the topic, mm -hmm. or you could ask him about himself, if it's a male. Could you ask them about other authors that have written books using pseudonyms? Or is that too obvious? 
you want to keep it on them as opposed to somebody else and stuff they've done. Uh, what other kinds of areas are they knowledgeable? Okay, they've written about topic X under their real name. Uh, what other things have you written about? And just see, now, the beauty of that is as you get closer to the heart, you'll see them react. That can be the interesting thing. So you pay attention to their how body handle, language? Or? How, how they handle it. Well, most of body language is in the voice. I mean, there's, you know, there's external stuff and there's, there's expressions on your face, which is body language. But the biggest body language is the tone of voice. What do you look for in their voice then? Do they become wary? They like if they up. sigh or something? Or? Yeah, that, or do they, uh, do they change their language? Do they become more short in their sentences? You know, all that kind of stuff. But that, that just tells you uh, they're probably getting annoyed if I better not continue. Or nervous, yes. And you just ask, what other things have you written? Right. Uh, and then you can ask, uh, by far the overwhelming majority of questions should be open. Yeah. Closed questions do have a role, but it's a minor role. And here's a case, you know, have you ever written anything under a pseudonym? That's the pretty direct. Yeah, You'll get but, to... <laughs> uh, but at the point, this is like the the football game where you're on the fourth and one, you mm-hmm, see. Mm-hmm. All you want is the yard. What's the best question you can ask about a book? See, questions are relative to the moment. Yeah, okay. Say, and War and Peace then. Or a book that you're okay. with, you're familiar with. How did you come to write this book? And you have to you have to start some. You see, the starting point is never exciting. Sure, yeah. but it's so important. Uh, and the ending point, you see, the question is. I can tell you what the best question is, but it's meaningless without the context. You see, so the question would be something like, "What happened then? Why? How did you do it?" Those are the dynamite questions, but. Right, I'm giving them to you without any context, and yeah. they're meaningless. Yeah. But in the right moment, they are really great questions. So, for example, how did you create that suspense in the yeah. book? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you go about doing yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. What process did you use? What techniques did you use? There's basically three kinds, like what, how, why. Those are, yeah. the, I mean, the where, the who, and the... Who, what, where, when, why. Who, where, and when are low order. They're open, yeah. but they're yeah. low order. Yeah. The what, how, why yeah. are the high order open questions. And basically, what did you do? How did you do it? Why did you do it? Kind of that order. How's that again? What, how, why in that order. Okay. Okay. What gives you the basic action? How gives you the process? Why gives you the reason? Uh, Terry Gross wrote, uh, again, she's a well known uh, interviewer for NPR. She mm-hmm. wrote a few points on, on interviewing and good interviewing one was vigorous preparation which we we touched on that's mm-hmm. obvious yes yeah. uh, like that's like read the book yeah i've been interviewed many times as an author mm. where people clearly didn't read the book and once on live tv they're saying well mr swatsky in your novel <laughs> <laughs> yeah reality sometimes yeah. stranger than fiction yeah yeah she, uh, one of the points she makes is to uh, be funny, be fun to talk to. Be receptive, be open, be, um, be, be a gatherer. Yeah, be I, organized, I was, organized, reasonably concise, energetic, enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, show, show that you're interested. Be yeah. interested rather than interesting. That's another thing, I guess, is you, you and I think Howard had a pro, has a problem with this. Mm-hmm. You don't want to overshadow exactly who you're interviewing. You want them to look good. That's where neutral comes in. You know, right. They're the star. You're the straight man. And you can't teach being genuinely curious. There are skills and there are talents. Talents are something you're born with. Skills are something you learn. And I think you can probably, to some degree, you can teach yourself to be curious to some degree. I, I don't think you'd get the whole way, but uh, you, you need to be curious. If uh, you were to recommend uh, an interviewer to watch because they are so good, could you name it two or three for, for me, please? Well, 
the uh, Mike Wallace isn't one of them. No, Mike Wallace is not one of them. <laughs> and and uh, just about every everybody on sixty minutes is not one of them either. Uh, most of the people that you see and hear on the air are not good interviewers. Because, and that's because they break a lot of the things that we're talking about here, rules? Yeah, and, and the reason they do that, they got on air because they're interesting. They're got, they got got on air because they're good talkers. You know? and, for mo- and that's largely a talent thing. It's yeah. not a skill thing. Yeah. And, uh, and so the, the talent that got them to be an anchor or a host serves them badly in the interview. And again, it's about... And this, this is the thing that the Howard Stern learned, right? And he's talking about right now when he's flogging his book. You know, he's going on and say, I hated my... I look back at my old self and I hate myself. Yeah. You know, here I was, this brash guy. I made the interview about me, you see. Well, he, was, he said he was very concerned that the interview not be boring. So he was, yeah. he was fearful of that. So he always wanted to kind of shock and come out with outrageous stuff because he was concerned it would be boring if he didn't. Yeah, exactly. And what he did is he smothered his guests. He made them boring. See, And then when they're boring, he said, see, I'm right. I have to be interesting. So it became a self-fulfilling cycle. If you want to see a comparison that's really interesting on that, compare Jay Leno with David Letterman. Now, I've conducted more than 100 seminars in which I started the seminar by conducting a poll in the room. And I go around, ask everybody, who thinks of the two hosts, you know, because they, they went head to head against each other, directly competing, who is the funnier guy? Every one of those polls I've ever done, 100% absolutely, Letterman was the funnier guy. Okay. Who won the ratings war? Leno. Leno consistently beat Letterman, you see. And then when Leno went to prime time, Leno be- uh, Letterman became number one, briefly. And then Leno went back to late night, And Leno went back to number one, and Letterman went to number two. Okay, nothing Letterman could do to beat, you see. But everybody agrees Letterman is the funnier host, you see. So why is the funnier host of a basically entertainment comedy show, why is he have the less funny show? And of course the reason is Letterman killed his guests. He denied them oxygen. See, he was always the star and he used his, his guests as props. And here is Leno, who actually understood the input-output process, made his guests shine. Leno knew when he was supposed to be the star. And when he was giving the monologue, it was about him. He was, he was the funny guy. When the guests came out, he flipped. Letterman never flipped. It's a bit like being a straight man to, uh, you know, Costello. Yeah, ex- exactly. Abbott and Costello. And Abbott was the straight guy. Yeah. And he got 60% of the revenue. Even though, <laughs> even though Costello got all the laughs. Yes. yes. Okay, without, without Abbott, Costello wasn't funny. This is the, the painful experience that Howard Stern has discovered. Letterman never discovered that. And I heard him interviewed recently, you know, since he's retired. And he was asked about it. He said, well, I did my best, the best I could do. And the thing is, it could have been corrected. He should have been the number one show because he was. Everybody agrees he was the funnier guy, and this is where bad methodology really holds him back. So you got to use your talents sparingly and pick your pick your spots. Well, it gets back to the, the first thing I was talking about earlier: input output. You know, the two the two big things: micro macro input output. That's that's the methodology I teach. Know when you're inputting, when you're outputting. When you communicate, there's only two things you really do. You, you send and you receive. You're like fax machines. Mm-hmm. Fax machines send, receive. That's all they do. When we communicate, human beings, that's all they do. We're like fax machines, right? Now, we're obviously not fax machines. We're way beyond that. Right. But in terms of communication, we use the same two modes as the fax machine. And so did David Letterman and Jay Leno. And to know when you're sending and when you're receiving. 
because if your if your goal is to receive, then you better not send. You know, and that's that's the lesson Howard Stern is coming to has kind of come to. He hasn't. I don't think he's totally figured out yet. He, he understands that's where he needs to go. Letterman never figured it out. Leno did. And you know who figured it out best of all? Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson wasn't the funniest guy. But he was the number one, the number one guy. Because he got the big issues right. Yeah. And that's that same set of principles I bring to the interview. You know, you got to get that right. That's, that's a... That's at the foundation, because everything, if you don't get that right, everything is built on the foundation of um, sand. So you're basing your evaluation, and I'm closing down here, you're basing your evaluation on the fact that more people want to listen to an interviewer who knows about input and output and knows to let the guest shine. Yeah, people, when people are listening to a program and there's a host on, a regular host, they already know that host. And after a while, the host just stops revealing new stuff because he or she has already revealed himself, right? So the host is always the same, every show. What's different is the guest. So how do you maximize the guest? And that's what it should be about. So why, when the, get, when the host is trying to interview, why should the characteristics of the host come out? It shouldn't, okay? If the characteristics of the guest should come out. It becomes a competition, in a, in a sense. It becomes a competition because there's only so much time and, and uh, one person is going to prevail and we want to put the spotlight on the guest. And, and as long as that's the goal, the channels of communication should match that goal. So this is why I say when you read up about me on the internet and people take notes, usually you, the notes that you see are, the, like, there's lots of tips and tactics that I have within the, the greater methodology. Uh, you'll see all those tips and tactics, but it, the important thing is what ties it all together. It's the big picture. You gotta get that right. And then the open neutral lean makes sense. So to get a really good picture of the big picture, your big picture, because I don't think I've actually done a good job getting that, we're going to have to wait for your book, which is part of the objective of the, of the guest who's on a podcast, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm working on the book right now. Okay. Yeah. I don't have a pub date for it yet, but... It's going to come out, though. It's going to come out. It's, it's half written. Okay. Yeah. No really, uh, real idea as to when it's going to be finished then. No, I am going to write it on my own schedule. And uh, That's good. I've written five books before, and I always had a contract. I had a deadline. And uh, <laughs> now I'm, I've... I've reached a stage in my life where I figure I can do it on my own deadline. Anything else you want to add? No, I think we've covered quite a bit of territory. Great. Well, we'll look forward to your book uh, whenever it comes. And I uh, really appreciate the time you've taken to oh, talk to me. It's been thank, a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. I've been speaking to uh, John Swatsky, who is an interviewing guru who for years worked with ESPN to train their on-air personalities? On-air and the producers, you know, the, the reporters, the hosts, the anchors, and the producers. And a lot of the executives, too, they take my course. Because hmm. they, they had to have the tools of analysis to, you know, to assess their own personnel. Mm -hmm. You still delivering that seminar or not? I'm giving one in two weeks at the IRE conference in Houston. Very good. So if you didn't get enough during our conversation, go to Houston. Thanks again. You're welcome.